I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we dive into the provocative world of a powerful book. It is called Confessions of a Gynecologist. It's written by Dr. Gary Andrew Dresden. In this gripping memoir, the doctor unveils the startling truths and behind-the-scenes secrets of an OBGYN's journey. We're delighted to have this very powerful author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank the team at Studio of Books for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support authors like him by subscribing to our channel and by purchasing his amazing book. The links are beneath this interview. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. And I'll call you Gary going forward. I know you requested that. Good. I think that's perfect. Um, great to have you on the show. Tell us what inspired you to write this book, Confessions of a Gynecologist? Well, I always had an interest in the social arts, and I wanted to tell a story that was similar to my life story, but not totally accurate for dramatic conflict to enhance the reader's interests. And uh, I wanted to tell a true life story of what happened to me on the journey and why I became a gynecologist and what happened on the journey to getting there. And it was a long trip. Yeah. You know, you can, in the third grade, if you offer a candy bar to a student now, or you say, if you wait 15 minutes, I will give you two, Three quarters of the class decides that they'll have the candy bar now. There are only a few that can delay gratification until the 15 minutes. And then there's a fight over the extra candy bars when the biggest kid in the class says, give me one of yours. So that's the life story that most people go through. We think it's supposed to be perfect, but the process is abusive. And in order to succeed, you have to have stamina and endurance and the willingness to get up off the ground every time you get knocked down. I'm sure you're an actor. You've had this happen to you day after day. Um, I've made a movie once with Jeff McKay. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that name. He yeah. is Robert Redford's cousin. And his mother asked Robert Redford, what do I do to send Jeff to Hollywood? He said, give him a one-way ticket and mm -hmm. nothing else. And that was Jeff's story. He was a character actor. He played some big roles on Magnum and so on. Uh, he was a decent and intelligent man, but his life was full of struggles too. For most people, if you want to climb the ladder to success, whether it's politics, medicine, acting, it's a tough journey and you're abused in the process until you get on top. And then it's your turn to either be fair and decent or to abuse others below you. So that was the purpose of writing the story. Yeah, absolutely. In the book, what would you say some of the most revealing or shocking uh, revelations can be found? All right. Well, I named the title such because that's a shocking question to most men. Yeah. What's, what is a gynecologist really thinking when he walks into the room and tells a lady, open your knees, please. And she spreads her legs and he can do whatever he wishes to do. When we grow up, at least in my era, it was a little tougher. Uh, until you played a sport that made you famous in high school, you didn't get girls. You were afraid to walk across the gym floor. And some kids, even if they were not attractive, sometimes they had the character and strength at the age of 12 or 13 to take that lonely walk across the gym floor to ask a girl to dance. Mm -hmm. So most of us are unsure about ourselves growing up in the process, and we certainly don't get a lot of attention. So now you become a gynecologist. And what is a sexual component to it? And the real truth is this. In the first patient or two that you see, you're amazed because there's no challenge. 
Yeah. You get to look at a girl naked and they're paying you to do that as opposed to you begging from the other side of the issue. Now, but it's under lights and there are drips coming out. Mm. It's not something that you imagine. Mm. It's real life truth. And there are pimples on the thighs. Mm. And there's a nurse in the room. And so all the peripheral information leads against any sexual encounter at all. And so you lose the sense of sex because the environmental conditions are not the same. So after you see two or three naked women for the first time, then there's nothing sexual about it because the information coming in from the outside doesn't contribute to it. Best example I can give is this. As residents, we would sit in chairs, maybe eight of us in a row, and take the next patient and slide down the chairs until it was our turn. A woman would come into the uh, lobby, short skirt, bend over to pick something up, and all of us would bend and turn and try to look up a skirt. Then you'd see that patient, if it was your turn, you were exhausted from all the work you had to do, and they say, come on, Dr. Dresden, your turn in the room. I say, can't he go? No, it's your turn. So you go into the room. She's on the table. The conditions are bright. The nurse is there. You ask a question or two. You walk in. You do what you have to do. There's no sexual component to it. Mm -hmm. But once you leave that room and you sit in the chair and she comes out in a short skirt and bends over, all of us want to look up that skirt. <laughs> I don't know how else to explain it. Yeah. It's all perspective. It's almost like exposure therapy. If you're afraid of mountains, if you stand on the edge of a mountain long enough, it'll mean nothing to you. That's See correct. enough of a woman's private parts, and it means nothing to you because you're basically numb to it, particularly in that surrounding. That's for sure. And I'm sure that's reassuring to uh, female patients out there who are wondering what's going on in the mind of a male yeah, provider I think, as well. I think you're totally right. The surrounding conditions dictate that there's nothing sexual about this so it loses that component for yeah. most gynecologists i can only talk about my own experience i'm not always sure what goes on in their minds but i think that 99 percent of the people i knew just had the same reaction because we talked about it from time to time absolutely what so challenges did you face as a male OBGYN? Well, coming up through the process of training was abusive and unfair. It's a little different today, but in my day, there was no limitation to how long a doctor could work. We were paid nominal amounts of money, not enough to live on. Fortunately, my family was comfortable, and I got help through training. And training was all the way up to the age of 30 years of age. So I had support. I was making $340 a month in my training back in the 70s, probably equivalent to 1000 a month today. You can't live on that. Right. And so I went to the head of my department one day after I'd been there for over a year and said, you know, is there any way to get us a raise? And his answer was this, raise? When I was a resident, I didn't get laundry money because things were different back in the 40s yeah. and 50s than they were in the 70s. Today, doctors have a limit on how many hours they can work in most states. I think it's 12 to 24 hours. Right. I would go to work every other weekend on a Friday morning, and I would come home on Monday night every other weekend. How much sleep did I get? Sometimes if I was lucky, I would get five or six hours a night. Sometimes, if I was really lucky, I might get eight in one night. Sometimes, I didn't get seven hours over three nights and four days of work. Mm -hmm. And you had to endure. And there was no complaint that you could make. Uh, you were used. I, I thought the experience of training was one of learning. It was not. You were used. 
as an entity that was functional for the complex that you were in. For example, in a community hospital, not in, in university hospitals, in a community hospital, the purpose of a residency program was not to teach you. It was to use you and protect the attending physicians from having to deal with the non-paying private citizen who just didn't have the money to pay, the indigent population. To do that, they got a residency program where they separated themselves from the indigent population. And the residents, early in the game, not skilled at all because they hadn't learned what to do, they took care of the indigent patients and hopefully they did the right thing or they had some resident above them who was nice, who they could ask what they would do. And you learn that way and you learn in an inefficient process. Mm -hmm. You go to surgery, you assist people in surgery and you watch what they do and you memorize what they do. And then you go back and study it in the books and you start to do it. Not really having a three-dimensional visualization of what you should have, but an understanding on the process. For me, I learned from a great surgeon, and I didn't only learn what he did in surgery. I learned every move he made from the moment of putting on his gown to putting on his gloves, sitting down in the chair, and then asking for the first clamp by moving his hand this way instead of that way. Mm -hmm. And I just imitated like an ape exactly what he did. And then they came out with a book called Siba, which had terrific drawings and three-dimensional views. And then I could put the package together. But in the beginning, I didn't have the package together. I was careful, conscientious, and frightened to death. And the learning experience is one by observation not by teaching most of the time. Most of these people in a community hospital are too busy and they want to get back to their practice. Now, that's not true in a university setting. In my first year, I took an exam called the CREOG exam, which graded you in all areas of obstetrics and gynecology. 90% of my time, I did obstetrics. 90%. I scored in the 5% uh, level in obstetrics. That's the lowest 5% in the country. Hmm. Why? Because the job of the attending physicians was to use us so they didn't have to come in at night to do cesarean sections. Our cesarean section rate was 1%. In the country, it was about 10%. Hmm. Now it's about 25% in the country. We had a 1% record of cesarean sections on the service because they made us pound these babies out with stimulants that we put into the IV bottle. So it was the wrong training, but it was consistent throughout the process. 25 OBGYNs in the whole group, and they were all interested in not having to come in at night. And so they taught you the wrong information. They didn't think they were doing that, but they were doing that. And it was all over the country at that time. Now, my son, who went through OBGYN, went through Dr. Spellacy's program at South Florida, and it was a different story. He was in the 99 percentile. Now, once I figured it out in a year, then I began to do my own sections. And then I would do 10 or 15% cesarean sections when they were indicated. And that's just one example. The purpose is not to teach. You may learn in the process, but it was to use you to facilitate their lives. Amazing. Very, very informative. Um, I've heard similar things from um, doctors who uh, are practicing right now that they say yes. in cardiac uh, surgery training, for example, 
the doctors that they're supposed to be training get very little hands-on training because that cardiac surgeon doesn't want his record marred, wants to do most of the work himself. And they're lucky if they get to even just sew up the patient when they're done. You hit the nail on the head. Yeah. And somehow you do learn. I mean, I practiced for 30 years. I never had a serious complication. I never had a death. And part of that is the image that the doctor creates toward the patient. I used to work in emergency rooms to make extra money. And I don't think a doctor is a doctor unless he learns how to do triage, separation of sick patients from healthy ones. Uh, there's a caricature of me. I hope it's still there. It was there after 40 years in the St. Pete emergency room, which is now a, a Humana hospital. And I didn't know what to do. Nobody trained me. I'm an early ER physician and they brought in a train wreck. They used to have 20 patients in 24 hours. All of a sudden, there were 65 people brought in, some laying on the ground, some standing up. I had never heard the word triage. Nobody knew what to do, including me. The head nurse didn't know what to do either. They're usually very helpful. Mm -hmm. And I got up on a counter. It finally hit me. I said, I want an IV and a blood test, a hemoglo hemoglobin on everybody lying down. Anybody standing up, ignore them. And I ended up with five patients that I had to deal with, and I was able to deal with them. One had a pneumothorax. I put in the needle, sucked out the air, spontaneous pneumothorax. You sometimes die with that. One had a belly full of blood, a, a ruptured spleen. One had a fractured bladder. One had a femur uh, injury with swelling and I didn't know that sometimes when you break the femur, you break the blood vessel and there's a lot of bleeding that happens. And this person became a little shocky. And then with the nurse's help, we figured it out and uh, we started giving him blood until the orthopedist got there. Uh, we were a little delayed, but fortunately it worked out fine. And I realized Every doctor has to be able to deal with any emergency, at least the initial setup, until the specialist gets there. And if you don't have that training, you only have specialty training, you're not a real doctor. You're just a technician. So that was fortunate for me. And the caricature was still up for me standing on the desk saying, I want an IV hematocrit on everybody lying down. A broken arm? Ignored it that you can fix later. So triage is, we didn't have the word then, but triage is the most important thing for a physician, I think. And then you can deal with your problem. Um, in gynecology, they didn't train us in the endocrinological component to gynecology. I didn't really know when I got out of my residency how to treat galactorrhea, amenorrhea, any of the endocrinological infertility. I, I was trained in surgery. And because I helped in so much surgery and we had so many indigent patients, nothing scared me in doing surgery. But in endocrinology, the book was 1,400 pages. The first 100 pages were on androstenedione, which is a derivative of testosterone. And there are 20 different hormones you have to learn to deal with, mm. hard to handle. And then Spiroff out of Harvard came out with a book of 100 pages, which explained each category clearly and easily. And in two days, I learned what should have been taught to me in four years. Mm. And fortunately, because I learned that, I was able to deal with the endocrinological problems. Otherwise, I had no idea. 95% of what you do is 5% of the knowledge. 5% of what you do is 95% of the knowledge. Nurses can usually learn by imitation to do 95% of the work. But your four-year training is really about the 5%.
that you have to implement once a month, once every six months, but that's what saves a life. What are your views on the reliance nowadays on PAs and NPs? I feel that their training is deficient compared to what happens when you train as a MD or a DL. They don't get the upper two or three percent. They have to be smart enough to know where the line is for them and where they don't know what to do and they have to ask for help. And the same thing is true in a specialty. When I learned OBGYN, we were the specialists that you came to. And then they started to come out with infertility specialists and oncology specialists. And in their little area, they knew more than we did. And you had to be willing to refer the patient to that individual. I'll give you the best example I remember. I was in practice for two years and a lady came in with a lesion on the top of her vaginal cuff. She had been treated for cervical cancer, stage two, 10 years before, and she was fine. I had never seen this before. Part of being doctor, a doctor is to realize if you haven't seen it and you don't know what to do, get help. Mm. I called the head of my department, who I won't name at the time, and I said, I'm not sure what to do here. He said, come on, Gary, for God's sake, you shouldn't be asking me that question. Just biopsy it, put some Lugol solution on, take the white spots, biopsy it, and freeze it with cryosurgery. So coming back to the room, I said to myself, that doesn't sound right. Hmm. She had cervical cancer. It spreads laterally to the lateral walls. I'm inside the vagina. I, I don't know what to do, but I, I shouldn't do that. I'll call the oncologist who hated me because I did abortions too. Hmm. And he was a devout Catholic, devout and really truthful in his feeling in life. And so he got on the phone with me because although he didn't know as much as I did in the general practice, in terms of oncology, he knew more. That was his sub specialty. So I got on the phone with him. I think his name was Cunningham. I know he's dead now. No, it may not have been Cunningham. I just don't remember. I said, I have this patient. He said, yeah, what, Dresden? I said, I have this patient who... Uh, has a lesion on the top of the vagina. He said, so what do you want to do about it? I said, well, she had cervical cancer and I want to biopsy it and take a sample, but I'm really not. He says, just shut up, send it to me. You don't know what you're doing. So I sent it to him and he put in a little radium treatment in the paramedia to the side of the vagina. And I think she lived another 10 years a relatively full life. And I said to myself, who is the best doctor here? And I realized the head of my department, he was the worst one because he was so cocky and confident. He knew what to do and he was wrong. At least I knew enough to call the individual who knew more, who was a nauseating person, but more skilled in oncology than I was. Right. Um, and that's what you really have to have to do and accept as a doctor. You don't know everything. And when you're not sure, call for help, even if it embarrasses you and makes you look small. I know when that patient went to him, he told her stories about me that were untrue, that she would never come back to me. And still, my job was to get her the best care possible. Did the right thing. I've been told... Just because a doctor is the uh, chief of surgery or whatever it is, don't let those titles sway you because that person got there not because they're a fine physician or surgeon correct, necessarily, but because they're a political animal. Political skills. Yeah. That's correct. That's, it's funny that you know all this. As friend, one is an anesthesiologist Ooh. at a top Northeast uh, medical center. The other is a critical care pulmonologist. So- we talk about this stuff quite a bit, believe it or not. 
Yeah, you yeah. need to, and I'm gl I'm glad they're telling you the truth. Yeah, most doctors wouldn't tell the truth back then. Absolutely. The Let me ask you this: you What do you hope readers take from this book that they become better consumers of medicine? Are you also hoping to impact um, the medical training of doctors in general with kind of an expose on the shortcomings? Yeah, that's a good part of it, but it's also to show that the travel of an individual through life where life is not perfect for most and it's not fair if you have enough money behind you if you have the opportunity to do it you get an advantage of being able to do the job that you choose to do in life um i'm jewish i'm a lousy jew but i grew up in a community of half jewish people long beach the interesting thing was our football team was 8-0 two years in a row. When we're the minority, then we hover and hide in the corners and go to concentration camps. When we're in the majority, we are just as abusive as any other majority there is in the world, as you can see with Israel. They're tough. They say, never again. And they don't go to temple. For the most part they pick up guns mm -hmm. never again that's their attitude are they too tough are they too unfair yeah yeah um there are things they shouldn't be doing that they need to be more gentle about and it's hard to do that when you've been abused for two thousand years um and that's true all all over the world the ukrainians they're fighting our war, right? Proxy war. Yeah, it's a proxy war. It's still a war. Yeah. And they're fighting it for us. Yeah. We have to do something about that. We have to stand firm. Uh, all of NATO has to stand firm. They all have to contribute. Do they? It's all political. Hmm. Even, even running for the presidency. Now... Kamala has a chance. Uh, is she political? You're damn right she's political. But Trump is worse. He's a tough guy. And he's a narcissist. And he's concerned about himself only. Hmm. It's hard to, for anybody to become president of the United States without having some narcissistic tendencies. Basically, what they say to their family is, I want to be president. And if I expose you to danger or a difficult life pathway that's different, I don't care. I want to become president. So that's how you start, right? Would I have done that job if given the opportunity? Yeah. So I have to look inside and say, do I have some narcissistic tendencies? And the truth has to be, yeah, you don't go through the pathway I went through in life and achieve the things you do without compromising your family and the people around you. I don't like to accept that fact, but now that I'm 83 years of age, I look back and say, yeah. Um, I went to a prep school after my sophomore year in high school. And it was called Woodmere Academy. Mm -hmm. I know. I don't know if you're familiar sure. with it. Part of the Five Towns. When Cohn was on a television interview with Trump's lawyer, mm -hmm. I forgot his first name. Roy Cohn. Yeah. yeah. Not Roy Cohn. Not Roy Cohn? No, oh, but, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah. Right. He's been in jail for three years. And I looked at my wife and said, This guy went to Woodmere Academy. <laughs> she said, what are the chances he went to Woodmere Academy? Well, I knew he lived in Queens, so that was one start. It was right. close to just the state of New York. Right. But still, there were 15 million people, so I said, I'm telling you, he went there. His condescending attitude, his obnoxious view of other people, and the way he described it were typical of every kid in my class. When I started, since I had been in public school, 
I took an English class in second period, and then I marked down all the questions on my arm to give to some kid who was in the seventh period because I wanted friends, and that's what you did in public school. Uh, I used to help. I was smart, so I helped a lot of kids in public school. It was us against the teachers. But in this prep school, after school, the whole boys' class ganged up on me in a corner and said, you don't do that. I said, why not? They said, we are marked on a curve. You help one student get a better grade, then they may be above us on the curve, and maybe I won't get into Harvard. I'll have to go to Brown. <laughs> God forbid. You don't want to go to Brown when you can go to Harvard. That's right. It now, is that me, kind of world, particularly in that kind of competitive environment. You find it at Woodenmere Academy. Yes. You find it at Columbia Presbyterian. You right. find it in the White House. If you're going to make it to the top, as Frank Purdue said, it takes a tough man to make a tender chicken. You know, I don't mean yeah. to make light of it, That's but there correct. is something about somebody who is steely yeah. and determined. And even if they have a velvety outside, Trust yeah. me, there's a hammer underneath it. This book we've been talking about today is a terrific book. It's written by a very insightful man, Dr. Gary Andrew Dresden. As you can I see, he's got it. strong views and strong opinions on a lot of things in life. Among them are the medical profession and yes. the practice of medicine. Uh, the, name of the book is Confessions of a Gynecologist. It is a gripping memoir that unveils the startling truths and behind the scenes secrets of an OBGYN's journey, and they're not what you think they might be. And the book and the information contained within could help you find a practitioner that is dedicated and determined to save your life. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Very welcome, Logan. I'm glad to be here, and you're terrific. I appreciate that, sir. You're thank really you. good at what you do. Thank you. Go ahead. To the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time until next time on okay. Spotlight. Good speaking to you. Bye-bye.